Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Green and Moulin Show here on Newcastle Fans TV. Today, we are joined by the new host of BT Sports Premier League coverage. And as an added bonus, she's born and bred in the North East. So it's a big North East welcome to Lindsay Hipgrave. Lindsay, welcome to the Green and Moulin Show. Thank you for having me on. It's lovely to talk to you guys. It is absolutely brilliant to be talking to you as well, Lindsay. And it's been a really, really... I think from your point of view, an exciting last few months. I think the first question is, is, well, the first thing I should say is congratulations on the promotion, Premier League host of BT Sports uh, Premier League uh, coverage this season and for the next few seasons, I can imagine. Um, when did you get told about the news and what was your first reaction? Were you calm when they told you, but very, very excited inside? Very excited, yeah. Um, I actually knew for quite a while before everyone else did, so it was kind of difficult keeping it a secret for quite a while. But um, I actually found out, um, this is going to sound like a bit of a flex, but on the on the day of the Champions League final in Paris, um, which I thought was a really, really nice touch from BT, they decided to, to give me the news um, probably a little bit earlier than they thought, but on the day of the final, I, I was doing some... Um, hosting over there and I think they just wanted me to have the best day and they wanted to tell me when I was over there they thought that would be a really good time and I just thought it was it was a lovely thing to do I was absolutely buzzing anyway to to be over there um, so I knew from I knew from that point actually and then and then had to had to keep it to myself for a while but it, it, it was just a dream come true to be honest. So was that always the dream then sports broadcasting um, when you were when you were little and what does that tie in with your kind of first memories of Newcastle United? Um, oh, God. Well, I mean, I've been watching Newcastle since I can remember. My, my dad's had me at a game since I was little. And um, it was during the good old days, the, the first lot of good old days when, when you couldn't help but fall in love with the team. Um, but as far as my background went, I, I always... I think I always wanted to get into broadcasting and media in, in some capacity because I, I was such a big football fan and loved it. Sport was obviously the, um, was the ultimate goal and, and the dream come true. But I started in radio, actually, um, in music radio. But I studied broadcast journalism at university. Um, and that was my, my first job, was, was writing new news bulletins for, for one of the presenters to read out on air. So I used to go in about half three, four in the morning and write the news bulletins. Um, and then one of the presenters left, so they asked me if I wanted to to work on the breakfast show because the host at the time was actually from Newcastle. Um, it was just one of those one of those lucky breaks, I guess. And I always got on really well with him. And he said, "Well, well, don't you know? Let's see if Lindsay wants to do it." So I did that for a few years, and, and then really thought I can I can keep doing this, and it's absolutely amazing. First of all, I don't want to keep getting up at four o'clock in the morning. But secondly, if I'm going to have a career in sports broadcasting, I'm going to actually probably have to make the move to London um, to take the next step. So I took a job at, at Five Live reading the travel bulletins. To oh. get my foot, foot in the door there. Yeah, so I'm, I'm yes, your expert please. on on motorway service stations and everything. <laughs> But that, oh. that was kind of how I first got got my first break in, in sport, really working there. And then I ended up working with, with Eamon Holmes and, and Danny Baker on Five Live. That's incredible. But the, 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 especially Eamon Holmes is like the king of breakfast te television anyway. So to no, get no, 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 no. If you're yeah. doing traffic and travel, then surely Sally Traffic was, is, is oh, more of a hero than Eamon Holmes. Well, I, I would have been Sally's competition, I guess, at the time. So. <laughs> yeah, good point. But no, I can Eamon, imagine. Eamon was we're brilliant and he and he still messages me now um occasionally especially if i'm working on a man united game to to give me send me a nice message which is which is always lovely to hear from him yes i can imagine definitely i have to ask when we ask footballers Lindsay was saying who was a the role model you know was it an alan shearer was it les Ferdinand, x y and said but from a broadcasting position who was your hero who was your role model who did you want to be well, there, there wasn't many women at the time working in that area, really. So, um, it, you know, there was a few trailblazers who were who were absolutely brilliant and and who I, I still look up to now. Gabby Logan being being one of the obvious ones. Um, she's absolutely incredible um, and just has such a vast knowledge across all sports. Um, and is such a professional. I, I love Gabby, um, but also yeah. Eleanor Aldroyd at Five Live. Um, yeah is an incredible broadcaster. Again, her knowledge is just 
outstanding across all sports. She's such a lovely person as well uh, and a top class broadcaster. Yeah, I've I've been interviewed by Ellie Oldroyd just Have after you? the after the takeover went through, but then uh, right, we were in right. mid flow, and then uh, they really well. Were you'll not... know what a top operator she is then. Oh, to the second when uh, she cut me off of the uh, Five Live News, but uh, <laughs> yeah, she's brilliant, especially reporting on cricket as well. Love Ellie Oldroyd; she's brilliant. Yeah, but... absolutely. And Hazel Irvine is another one. You know, yeah, the, like yes. I said, there weren't very many women who who I had to look up to at that time. It was mainly men doing the, the sort of jobs that I hoped to to one day have. So they were the ones I actually looked at and thought, you know, maybe possible. Fast forward to to now and and what you're doing presenting the Premier League and you just springs to mind. Me and Johnny were both at Anfield um, for that wonderful two one defeat. You um, have to take me back there. Yeah, but but you were there, stood alongside Shea Given. I mean, you know, McManaman and Rio Ferdinand were there as well. But you know, Shea Given. What what's it like now working with? Presumably, you love Shea Given as much as we all do because he's just an absolute the best ever goalkeeper we've ever had. So, what what's it like working with these legends? Just amazing. Um, sometimes you still have to pinch yourself. I think when you're you're working alongside these people that used to go to the grounds watching when you when you were younger and just absolutely worshipped. Um, you know the likes of Alan Shearer and and Shea, like you said. Um, you, you you hope it will happen, but you don't think at the time you're you're going to end up working alongside them. So to be standing there, listening to the fans as well, we were right in front of the away end. So the chance of there's only one Shea given were in full flow. Yeah. Um, it was great. I almost wanted to join in. What what with the Shea given one or the Rio Ferdinand one? Oh, definitely the Shea given one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, be, to be fair, I know there's a bit of beef between Newcastle fans and Rio Ferdinand, but he took it very well. Fair play he, to him. He did but, take it, it. He took it very well, actually, because uh, it was it was deafening at one point. It, it was one of those where I kind of I had to mention it because there was there was no way around it. You know, <laughs> I, I just kept thinking, why on earth are we are we standing here with Rio in front of the away fans? That was a bad idea. Yeah, but he did. He, he handled it very well. Oh, he certainly did. He certainly did. And again, I think, I don't know where you could have put him on in that ground because again, Anfield, Liverpool, Man United, Liverpool, it's he a tough one, but he did it. take it very well. Yeah, definitely. He, admi- he admitted some of his comments were possibly a bit misplaced, I think. So. Well, did, did you have to educate him? Like, rewind to when he said, we all know what we're referring to, when he said them things about, you know, Mike Ashley's spend at Newcastle. Did, did you have to maybe educate him the next time you saw him? I've wound him up about it a few times. But, um, <laughs> I, I think he knows what he's he knows what he's saying and he knows what he's he knows what he's doing with those comments. But um, I'd like to think if he could, he would take them back. But um, mm. who knows? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure he would. I'm sure he would. I have to be honest with you, Lindsay, because this is, I think, the, one of the best jobs in football, if not the best job in football, to be commentating or presenting live Premier League football week in week out. Yeah. And obviously the example being this weekend, Arsenal versus Tottenham, North London derby, you know, it doesn't get much bigger than that in terms of football matches to, to, to be the host of. Can you just tell us what your week is like going into a game like this? Because obviously there's, there's been no obviously European football in terms of Champions League, Europa League um, this week because of the international football. So how much preparation goes into a game like this? And what do you want from your pundits? What do you want in terms of the conversations that you're going to be leading into? Well, first and foremost, I think um, maybe a lot more than people actually realise, I think. Um, I think, well, well, I'm desperate for it to come back for a start with the, with the international break. It's felt like a, a long wait. And, and as you both well know, watching England at the moment is a, is a bit of a struggle. So um, I'm desperate for it to come back. But... Um, so today, the, the first message came in today, um, setting up the WhatsApp group. So there's a different WhatsApp group each week, depending on who the pundits are, who's working on the show. Um, so that'll normally be set up on a Tuesday or Wednesday. Depend- it might be a bit earlier if that team perhaps is playing in the Champions League on a Tuesday or something, just so we can share ideas during the game. Um, and that just sort of sparks the initial conversations where people put in their ideas, things they want to talk about, they make suggestions. Um, So I very much want the pundits to lead 
the discussion in terms of the things they want to talk about because it has to be something that they're passionate about that they care about not something that we're sort of force feeding them I think it has to be the things that they've spotted they want to really get into before the game um so that will start and then I'll have a I'll probably talk to my producer this afternoon for the first time um and we'll start talking about more the structure of the show which interviews we have pre-match um I think we're we'll be hoping to get one of the managers at the top of the show um and we have Cesc Fabregas on this week as well which is great for us because wow, this is nice. a different guest um so that's really exciting as well it's nice to bring someone in who we don't work with regularly as well especially on a big game like that and they can add a different perspective a bit more inside knowledge perhaps so it'll be really exciting to find out you know what he wants to bring to the show and the things he's happy to get into um and then we start working on on running orders and scripting things and prepping interviews and things like that and then towards the very end of the week we start getting sent clips so our analysis team will put together clips based on the things that the guys want to talk about they'll put together those runs of analysis um and give us those for a look so the guys can then say um you know or whoever is on whether it's rachel brown finnis or rio or peter they will turn around and say oh you know can you take this clip out don't quite need that one um it's very much catered to the things that they want to they want to look at and they want to discuss which is as it should be yeah, I mean, it, it, it is interesting because obviously ex pros, legends that that are, are pundits now. And do you kind of, I mean, you must sort of pick up extra things that you wouldn't sort of notice through like our eyes as opposed to their eyes who have been there, seen it all, and played the game. And you must learn so much off them. Yeah, I think it's not, it's not just sort of during the week as they're messaging when they're watching games during the week, it's sitting during that that first half when you're getting ready for the first half analysis, which is always a challenge because you've got about two and a half, three minutes with the breaks at half time. That's always the tough, toughest bit because they've always got so much to say. Um, but just watching a game with them sort of through through their eyes and then picking picking things out that, that we can then look at is is fascinating. And that's again, it's a, it just, it's a dream come true to be sitting watching games alongside those guys. You know, they're the ones who've won Premier Leagues, they've won Champions Leagues. Um, they know the game inside out. So, yeah, it's it's fascinating, but it's, it's also an education as well. When that first game uh, in August came, it was at Fulham versus Liverpool. Yeah. Were you were you nervous? Or because you obviously you're so experienced now, Lindsay, and you've done so many different games, obviously from studio, from pitch side, from wherever... Did, did you feel as nervous or did you did you feel like there was a spotlight on you or did you feel like, look, the spotlight's the game? It's not me, it's the game. It's a really good question, actually, because I, I talked a lot about this afterwards. Oh, don't my... tell him that, Lindsay, because he'll be going <laughs> mad in the WhatsApp group. We had this last week where someone said, really good question. We're <laughs> it in the NFTV WhatsApp group. <laughs> Only because it was something I talked, I talked a bit about afterwards because obviously it, you know, if you look at it from the outside it's, it's just me doing a game of football which I've been doing for years and years and I obviously did a lot of Premier League during Covid as well because mm. BT had so many more games as all the broadcasters did we, we broadcast every single game um, so it wasn't like presenting Premier League games was a new thing for me um, but it felt very, very different on the day. So, yeah, is, is the honest answer to that. I was very nervous. Um, and I think a lot of it was, was down to a lot of lovely messages I was being sent from people. Um, everyone was being so lovely and so kind. I, I had so many good look messages on the day. It made it feel like I was doing something completely new and something different. Um, so I felt a lot of responsibility, I think, as well, to, to do it justice and really deliver it properly. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it was the same thing. It was, it was the same going to work, presenting a game, the same build-up, the same preparation, but it just, it just felt like a, a bit more pressure, I think. So I was glad to get the first one done. Is it that feeling of responsibility then that kind of keeps you sort of grounded, especially when you want to be a bit irate? Like, again, not to take us back to that Anfield game where mm. Liverpool score after 40 minutes of stoppage time that, that I'm guessing 
<laughs> yeah, I'm guessing inside you would you were fuming as we all were, but is is it that responsibility that kind of keeps you tempered and grounded? Yeah, definitely. I think that was probably the hardest post match I've ever had to do, without a doubt. Um, I think I was in shock. Actually, I think I was actually in shock. I couldn't Tell believe me about it. it, and I was really just thankful that I had Shay there because I felt like I could keep my composure and almost direct how I was feeling about it by just directing those questions to Shay and letting him unload <laughs> out of the situation, which which is what I should be doing. Um, but I think, yeah, I think I was pretty stunned and in shock and I, I found it very, very difficult not to show any emotion. But um, I think I managed it just about. Oh, you certainly did it. The word I would use is professionalism. <laughs> After that, <laughs> definitely professionalism. I was, I was fuming inside. <laughs> and I, we we had to, we did a few videos still after am. the game. Yeah, still am. And I was given the, I was given that I, I don't know if it was an honour or given the um, opportunity to do in what we call the match reaction. And I had my brother there. My brother was actually a Liverpool support, and that was just the hardest three or four minutes trying to describe that yeah. game. But again, we'll talk. We'll touch more about new, the new Newcastle United if you want to call it that. But. Um, coming back on to obviously the, obviously the reaction and everything, what was the best bit of advice you were given? I don't know if it was Jake or a, a, somebody that you worked with uh, over the years. Is there anybody that's given you the best bit of advice when it comes to broadcasting? Um, oh God, lots lots of people along the way. Um, I think I, I had an, an amazing message before um, before that Fulham game, actually the first one of this season from Ian Wright, um, and and he was. It was absolutely out of the blue. He just he's just that sort of a guy. He's such a great guy. He just sent me a lovely message and and he just told me to to be myself. You know, he, he said that being you and doing what you've been doing has, has got you to this point. So don't change anything. Um just keep being you. And I just thought it was such a such a lovely thing to say because I think the temptation is when you're taking over a, a position like that, that does bring that sort of responsibility um to try and maybe change too much or or not realize what got you to that point because you're trying to fill somebody else's shoes but really you, you you've got to do it in your own way um so that was a really nice thing from him to hear uh, from someone like righty as well of course um uh, but i've everyone. had i've had great advice from so many people i'm so lucky i mean glenn hoddle as well you know everyone has ups and downs in their career as well you make the odd blunder here and there and even if it's it's something trivial that other people move on from very quickly. They sort of play over in your mind, especially if you're a bit of a perfectionist like I am and, and you want everything to go perfectly. And and Glenn said to me, you know, one time, you know, it's not the mistakes we make in life, Lindsay, it's how we respond to them. And and again, it's just a simple bit of advice, but it just picked me up when I needed it and, and made me want to work even harder. Love that. Everyone loves Ian Wright as well. It's impossible. Oh, not to he's love honestly Ian. He's, he's so lovely. It was it was such a such a thoughtful message. Um and and, a, and a, a good thing to hear, actually. Good advice. Absolutely. Um with the with the way BT's coverage is presented, obviously we touched on it before, being pitch side instead of like the old kind of style in a studio, quite formal. Is that what something that you very much prefer? Obviously, working in radio, you used to being cooped up in a studio, but getting a flavour of the atmosphere pitch side, is that something that you really enjoy? Definitely. It's it's what it's all about, isn't it? You, you want to be at the game. You want to be soaking it up. And I think, especially as someone who worked during that whole um, COVID period where we I was presenting games in the grounds without the fans in, and that was, that was hard, just the, the soulless of it you know it was it was just it was it just felt so wrong it, it felt like training games um and and it, and it was just missing the whole essence of, of what football is to me so I think now to, to go back to being pitch side with fans in is it's perfect I, w- I wouldn't want it any other way and also I feel like we get a little bit more access now as well so mm. we can we can speak to players pre-match um briefly sometimes but at least we're, we're having a bit of interaction with them a lot of the managers are coming over to us for their pre-match interviews now so it means our pundits can ask them questions rather than we're away from them in a studio um and you know they can't get involved in that interview and, and some of their insights brilliant you know they'll ask a question that that someone like me who hasn't played 
played the game, uh, let alone at that level, will we'll think of something completely different. And I think there's a lot more value to that. There certainly is. There certainly is. I actually remember when you were uh, pitch side for the Merseyside derby. I think yeah, I think obviously you could hear the Everton supporters because big dunk, Duncan Ferguson yeah, walking yeah. around with you. I bet you I, I could just see him, he's just giving the old fist pumps towards um the, 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 the I forget the stand now, but it was obviously the uh, the Gladys Street, that's the one, Gladys Street uh, stand. And, yeah. And I could and I could just I could just see obviously the the noise build and then that just must just you must feel so motivated yeah. just to give it the perfect build up and you you probably didn't have to do a lot when you've got all that noise coming from the air uh, that was like my highlight i think so far this season actually again it's, it's good that you mentioned that <laughs> i'm getting, getting you all the time getting you all the time you out. It, was, it was a real highlight for me that season actually that little walk around past gladys street with with big dunk um it's my first time working with him oh my god what really? an amazing guy he is just lovely and, and an absolute legend and it was just a privilege to be at Goodison with him walk, walking around the ground um, and he absolutely loved it you know he he, he just soaked it up and it, it was it was a really special moment that actually and also the fact that we had Crouchy there who scored in front of the Gladys Street end as well yeah. and he, was, <laughs> he, he then started remembering like the looks on people's faces as he scored that goal when he was in front of that stand and and I think being there sort of put him right back in that place so he loved it for different reasons and you probably wouldn't get that in the studio well you wouldn't no, no it, it, it was it was brilliant but I'll like say it was your first time working with Big Dunk and you were probably the only person in around that vicinity that maybe wanted to ask him about what happened between him and Rude Hullet after the the, <laughs> the, the, the time where Derby or, or something like yeah. that just off camera, did you maybe touch uh, touch on his time at Newcastle? Because obviously he's Mister Everton, so you know there wasn't that much to go on for his new time at Newcastle. But did you did you talk about we, it? We we did, but but mainly from from the the um, sense that his son's there um, at yeah. the moment. Um, so and he's loving it. So yeah, we t- we talked about that a lot. But he loves he loves the city, and he's really happy his son's at the club. So so we did talk about it. he loves Newcastle. And he loves he loves the people as well. So it, yeah, it was it was nice to talk about that. Yeah, I can imagine. I can certainly imagine what, like I say, if you got your son there as well, I think that makes probably makes it brilliant. But you've I've still got a different... bad neck oh, after that game, by the way. Crouchy and Big Dog. Crouchy and Rio was about um, Rio must be six four or something as well. So I literally <laughs> spent and I don't think I'm that short really. But I, I, I literally <laughs> spent the whole game. Like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ming. Well Sat was well, well, Sadly, you're about six four as well, and you're six three, six yeah, four. So yeah, yeah, just... yeah. So, so you were you, when you know we watched the Forest and Liverpool games together, you know how Lindsay was feeling. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, always looking up to you, Sam. Don't worry, I'm always looking up to always, you. Always um, looking up. Exactly. Um, Lindsay, you've worked on, I was just doing some research, and, and you've done so many different, oh, like, worked for so many different companies. Well, no, you've worked for so many different companies. I've got Al Jazeera, I've got Satanta Sports, when Satanta Sports was still, still a company. But Channel 5, Channel 5 was just something that kind of popped in my head when you were there during the championship season, when obviously Channel 5 had rights for... Uh, the football league and the league cup as well, and obviously that was a season that was actually very, very good for Newcastle in the sense that they were promoted back to the Premier League. How did you find yeah. work working uh, while Newcastle were doing well, winning games of football for a change after the period that we've just kind of had before the takeover? They, that was one of those jobs that was just perfect timing. Um, I felt very lucky at that point to to get that job at the season when Newcastle were obviously there in the, in the championship and actually had the opportunity to really follow that campaign very closely and, and, and watch us winning games. Um, so it was great, yeah. And, it, and it, I just think it's really good for your general knowledge doing a show like that in terms of the, the whole pyramid, covering sides that you, that you wouldn't normally look close at. You might check the result, obviously, that, but you're not looking into it in, in great depth. And obviously, there was the whole Brighton thing running alongside it as well. And I live in Sussex. So I'm not far from Brighton. Oh, right. So I know I know a few people there as well. And, and they're, they're brilliant people. It's such a nice club. Um, so I do have a soft spot for Brighton as well. But we, we obviously had that battle all the way through and then, and then picked them at the end. Um, when I think they celebrated a bit too quickly, I think. They yeah. Were, do you I, own a scarf? I, now you're near there. The <laughs> <Brighton> <laughs> <champion>. <laughs> oh no, I've not that much. Um, 
much of a soft spot. They don't work. They don't, my <laughs> colours are well and truly black and white. But um, but I just think it's a it's a great club, and uh, I really enjoyed that sort of battle with them throughout that season. Um, and it was just yeah, it was just really good timing. It was a, it was a really good fun show to do. Apart from the fact it was every Saturday night, which is a total sort of life killer. Um, and uh, yeah, it was it was just perfect timing that it was that it was Newcastle's sort of really good good championship season and then, and then to get the get the Premier League gig on a season where things are really looking up for us now and, and actually to start that season not just with so much optimism about my own career and, and be really enjoying that side of it but with so much optimism about my club as well it's it's nice not to start this job going into it thinking are Newcastle going to scrape survival <laughs> I mean, we ask most of our guests this now these days, but where were you take overnight? And did it make you, obviously you say you live down in Sussex, did you? Did it make you want to jump on the train and just go to St. James's Park watching the scenes unfold? Yeah, totally. I was just at home, I think, and um, following it from here. But yeah, definitely, I, want, I wanted to be there. It, um, it, it took me back, actually, to being in the city when we got promoted under Keegan and the open top bus parade came through because I went into town on that day and it's still one of my best memories as a Newcastle fan being in the city to soak up that atmosphere and it really felt like it was replicating that where the whole city just descended to St James's Park and wanted to wanted to celebrate the way it went off it just felt like that buzz was back in the city no, oh, it, it, I, I, again, I think that Tottenham game. I know that was it was live on another television station, which I'll we'll, I'll not mention. Um, but um, <laughs> but uh, I could just that Tottenham game and the whole experience. It was it was the, I think the words that's been used a lot, Lindsay, is hope. The hopes now back mm-hmm. at the club, and there is an optimism that Newcastle can do something. Do you believe in that hope that something will happen in a really good, positive future for Newcastle United right now? Yeah, no, definitely. I, d- I do have that optimism and um, I think they're going about it the right way. That's what I like as well. It's not, it's not let's go crazy and spend, spend you know, a ton of money on, on a random, you know, squad boost without actually any <laughs> sort of strategy in place and any plan. Um and I, I just feel like they're doing it from the, the foundations up and doing it properly, putting the right people in place, taking good advice um, and, and putting a structure in place um, to to build something rather than just try and spend your way to something very quickly, actually build something that's more sustainable. Um, and obviously it is still a work in progress. You know, I'm already seeing people that are all, all too many draws and this is not going in the direction it should it's like hang on a minute there is so much progress there that's clear to see we should have a lot more points on the board than we actually have I think some of the performances have been a lot better than the results and we are not one of the top teams yet let's not run before we can walk you know and I think a lot of the people who are saying these things are outside of the club they're not Newcastle fans most Newcastle fans I think have that realism and want to do things in that way um but I think because we're not sort of sitting in the top four already and have you know, won six out of seven, everyone's going, you know, what's gone wrong at Newcastle? Well, nothing's gone wrong, actually. This is just something that is a work in progress and we're clearly not there yet. You know, we've we've spent a lot of money, um, but but we had years and years of underinvestment. So we're making up for, for lost time, really. And and you can't just say, oh, you've, you've had a couple of decent windows and you should be doing better. You know, we had to make up so much lost ground. We, we still don't have the depth there. So you get a couple of injuries and obviously it's going to affect us. And if Brentford come in and offer you 10 grand less a week, then <laughs> then, 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 then players are going to go there. I mean, what, what, what do, I mean, what do you do when something like that happens? Do you know what? There, there are certain people that you work with at certain times who you know are saying things to get a reaction so I think the best thing that you can do in those moments is not give them the desired reaction um and just let them make their point however ridiculous and and the backlash will will do its own job (laughs) do you know what I mean yeah yeah (laughs) Sometimes not not taking the base is the, is the best option. 
Mm. I was I was going to say, how difficult is it not to express an opinion? Because that's not really your role, is it? As no. a presenter, you're, you're pre- the presenter asks the questions. You're not there to give an opinion. But yeah. when you have like obviously the moment that Sam's talking about, and I'm guessing you would have had that moment when you've been um, hosting, you know, Champions League games, Europa League games, Premier League games over the over the years. How how frustrating is it not to go? Do you know what I want to express an opinion? in a way that I could actually lead it into another question, if you like. Yeah, um, it is, yeah, it is hard at times, but I think I, I respect the role and I understand what the role is. So I know what's, what's acceptable and what the line is. As you said, there's certain ways you can sort of insert something into a question where you can direct it a, a certain way to, to maybe get the, not the response, but certainly a discussion started that that you want but you but you do really have to make sure that you don't cross that line but the incident that you're talking about the incident um, (laughs) what was on radio and I think it is very different on radio I think certainly um on that station as well they they want you to have more an opinion and it and it's perfectly acceptable and it's perfectly fine and there has been times when I've really um expressed it quite quite openly um like doing radio shows it's it's very very different I, I think tv um feels like you do definitely have to rein that in and really respect your role as as the facilitator of the the discussions rather than someone who's sticking your two pen of in yeah yeah the but it's hard yeah i can <laughs> I, I, I can fully imagine um i mean i'd i'd I don't live that far away from like where Garab Bayab Banglahor grew up, and like you're saying that that's better than the northeast. And looking around, going really, mm. <laughs> I'm from round here too. Well, I'm not sure it is. I'm not sure it is. But anyway, um, back to Newcastle stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, some what? some people are more provocative than others. You know, yeah, and you've just got to deal with that. Yeah, yeah, and I know why they're and knowing why they're saying certain things, and know that they're. I reckon deep down they actually genuinely don't believe that one for one second. So yeah. it's just to get a reaction sometimes. No, you're absolutely right. And um, they'll all be eating their words in a few years' time. As, as you say, it's, it's a long-term project, but we've already got players now like Bruno, who is chuffing, is just chuffing magic. Um, yeah. And we're already uh, seeing green shoots of, of promise. I mean, just how excited are you to see this squad, this team gel together and develop and, and see more players like Bruno and Isak, Botman, St Maximin come back to, to Newcastle United like the good old days? It's brilliant. I, I, I love the players that we've got. I just want to keep them all fit enough at the same time so that we're seeing them all on the pitch at the same time regularly enough. That's the, that's the problem at the moment. There's, there's so much promise there and we've seen so many exciting moments from you know, from these new players, but we're just not getting them on the pitch at the same time. I want Bruno in there regularly. We want, we want Isak and some Maxman all starting at the same time. Wilson to be fit. Um, and it's just, just not happening at the moment. So that's my concern is that we still don't sort of have that depth and we're missing a couple of key players. And that's when that's when we're not picking up the results. Um, but as far as going forward, you know, there there's some there's some brilliant players in there and and I'm very excited about about what's to come. I mean, Isak looked fantastic at Anfield, didn't he? Um, we, we we know what he can do and what he's capable of. And Bruno, I think, is just an absolute game changer. He, mm. I love him. I'm just I'm surprised we got him. I, yeah. I really am. Yeah, I think there was there was a report in the summer saying that Manchester City and Liverpool couldn't believe that Newcastle managed to get that deal done for Bruno. So that just shows how highly he's rated. But you yeah. talk about the well, players. Well, I'm but... married to a Man United fan who just every, on on an almost weekly basis, like it's exactly what we need. You know how <laughs> how did you get him? Why have we yeah. why have we not gone into someone like him? Why why not? <laughs> We've got the better okay. Bruno. Well, there you go. We do. We do. <laughs> I was I was going to mention that a little bit later on the fact that your husband's a Manchester United supporter. So what's it like when Manchester United are playing Newcastle? Do you do you keep yourselves away from each other for that one that that, that, oh, that one def- day that ninety minutes? It's definitely, like as far opposite ends of the sofa as you as you can imagine when it's like the hip grave derby. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, no, no, it is. We actually, I took him to St James's when we were up last Christmas for the for the Man United game because it fell over, it fell over Christmas, and um, they got a draw, and we were way better than them. Yeah, and um, and he just wouldn't accept it. He actually just wouldn't <laughs> accept the fact we deserved to win. That he was the only person in the whole place who didn't think that we were we were much a better team. Um, Out of them. Yeah, absolutely. Abs- absolutely. And and I was so excited at, at that point about what was to come um, because you could just see how much better we were. And and also to, for him to see the atmosphere at St. James's during that game because I'd taken him before and it was just so flat. And he was saying, what, what is this St. James's Park atmosphere that you've been talking about all these years? Like, I don't know what I don't know what you're talking about. Um, it's it's quiet and it's flat. Mm. And I'm saying, but you don't you don't understand what it's like. Like the background when I grew up, that that experience of being in there, it's it's hard to explain it. And he just didn't get it. And then he he re- that was the first time he actually got it. Yeah, I mean, that 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 game as well. That I think was the time where we all just sat up and took note and go, wow, Joe Linton, that's. Uh, since what he's prime he Vieira bossed, he all of a sudden, it, didn't he? Yeah, he absolutely bossed it. What have you ever seen a transition before? like that before? I don't think I have. I don't think I have. Um, and credit to Howe and, and, and his coaches, you know, for spotting that in him. Um, because when he played in Germany, that's that was his strength, was, was leading the press. Um, and he was never he never played as an out and out number nine because we spent that much money on him and, and everyone just expected this amazing centre forward who was just going to bang goals in left, right and centre and, and he was never that in Germany um, so no nobody was working to his strengths and, and Eddie Howe knew how to do that straight away and he's, he's one of the best midfielders I was going to say in the league but I actually think in Europe full stop at the minute he's, he's that good um, he's relentless and, and you wouldn't want to play against him he just He's just so rel- relentless. Is, is the best word for it? I think he's there's an attitude out. and a swagger about him now as well, isn't there? That it's like when he was up front, yeah. he was just so in his shell, so so lacking in confidence, and and that came across. Like you said, you could see it in the body language, um, and and he was being battered. Let's be honest about it. We, I mean, I feel guilty about it um, as a fan. I think there's there's plenty more like me about the treatment that he got because we didn't get behind him. We didn't support him. We, we pretty much all saying to each other, Oh, he's useless. He's rubbish. He's, you know, but he wasn't, we weren't playing to his strengths and we, and we didn't realize what a brilliant player there is in there. Um, and I just feel like he's such a nice person. Everyone speaks so highly of him at the club and, and the way he is in training and in the dressing room. Um, and, it can't have been easy, you know, to go to go through that and, and get such a battering and everyone everyone saying you're you're rubbish. Um, to come through that mentally as well, I think is is just as just as much an achievement as it is what he's done with his all round game. You know, the mental mm-hmm. side of it. You touched on it there, Lindsay. It's to do. The manager has a massive impact in that as well. And I know you've had the pleasure of interviewing him uh, in Newcastle as well. I think it was before the Liverpool game and. Did you bring your dad along as well? I remember, I remember yeah. as well. He got, he, got, he got the chance to visit, visit Mr. Eddie Howe himself. He, he did. You know what? Um, it, yeah, my dad was going to pick me up um, from the station. I thought I just presumed the interview would be at the at the training ground. So, um, as my dad always does when I'm when I'm back at home, he's my taxi driver. So he was like, "Oh, I'll just drop you off and wait in the car." And then I realised it was at the Copthorne Hotel. Um, and my dad was in the car outside, and I, I don't know. I think when they came in, someone said, "Oh, is that your is that your dad outside waiting outside?" Um, and um, I think I said to one of the cameramen or something, "Oh, yeah, he's 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 parked out the front. He's just waiting there." Um, and the Newcastle press officer said, "Oh, just bring him up, you know, <laughs> bring him up." And I said, "Oh no, I'm not going to do that when I'm working." He's yeah, it's fine. Eddie doesn't mind. It's all right. I thought, well, you know what? My dad is a deep sheep, but all his Christmases are going to come at once. So I rang him and said, you know, do you want, do you want to come up and watch the interview? So I don't think anyone's ran into the lift quicker. Um, <laughs> my mum was with him as well, though. And they'd been watching my nephews playing football. So she was going, you know, I haven't got a look a right clip. 
stuck on coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but it was really lovely because they they both obviously got to watch me at work, and my dad my dad was just um, just loving being being in the room. Well, while I interviewed Eddie Howe on the balcony, it was it was brilliant, a good moment. It's it's nice to pay him back a little bit, my dad, with moments like that because it's he he's the reason that I love football so much, and you know they've always really supported me with with everything. So I, I love little moments like that where it feels like it's a little bit of payback. Yeah, I mean, it was such a fantastic in, interview with him as well. What did you feel coming away from uh, that time spent with Eddie Howe? Because obviously, as we all know, Newcastle's a very unique club, unique mm. fan base, and um, people from outside are a little bubble, either get it or they don't. Yeah. Does Eddie Howe get it? Yeah, definitely. Um, I definitely feel that. Um I feel like he's really happy there as well. Um, I know there was a lot of talk about whether, you know, he would ever want to move away from home and, and the move to Burnley didn't work out and whether it, you know, where even further north than that, how is, how is he going to manage there before he wants to go back down south? Um, but sometimes it's just the wrong club at the wrong time and it, mm. and it doesn't work out. And, and it's not, it, I don't think it was about the geography with Burnley. And I think it's, it's about the whole picture, isn't it? And I think he's, he's very happy there. Um, he's obviously very well backed in terms of the, the new contract that they've given him. They have put their faith in him. So he knows that he's, he's got that support. Um, and I think, yeah, I think he's happy. He's happy in the city. His family are, are going to be moving up as well. So that'll, that'll make him even more settled. Um, but he does, he gets, he gets the club, he gets the connection with the fans and how important that is. Um, and he wants to use that to, to his and the team's advantage. But also, I think he's, he's just absolutely loving the way the, the fans in the city have responded to him. Oh, it's just incredible. Like, I, I being the season ticket holder myself and you see the love he gets every single game, that, that his yeah. chant gets sung so many times throughout a game. And he has really taken on the, taken the city to his heart and you can tell that it means so much to him and he puts so much work into it like I think he'd said in a separate interview he, he was there from like six o'clock in the morning like I know that just it sounds a bit strange saying that because a lot of people in, the, in Newcastle get up and have to be at work for say six seven o'clock but for a football manager it's a bit unique you don't expect them to you kind of expect them to come in at 10 yeah take training have the lunch maybe a debrief in the afternoon and done by half two three o'clock but it, it's 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 almost as light he's I, think I, would I don't think he best. switches off from it. I don't yeah. think he switches off from it at all. And actually, we spoke, um, not in the interview, um, but before that, because we were at the cop board, um, and we were talking about him being in the in the Hilton on his first game because he tested positive for COVID yeah. oh, and yeah. just how, um, how difficult that was for him just not having that control because I think it's, you know when it when it comes to when it comes to work and football he just he's a control freak and he wants to be involved in everything. And I think he just felt so detached from it and, and frustrated as well. The fact that there was such a build up to it and then he couldn't be there. Um, it, I think that was probably one of his, his hardest moments as a manager actually being stuck in that hotel. Yeah. That's just, that's just typical Newcastle though, isn't it? Yeah, just, yeah, it felt like that like at that. the time, didn't it? It did feel like that at the time, but I just came away from it as well. I think feeling how pleased I am that that we've got someone that represents the club so well. He speaks so well and he comes across so, so well. Um, yes, obsessed with the football side of it, but also I just think a brilliant ambassador for the club as well. And we haven't always had that, let's be honest. Um, it's it's nice to have someone that that, you, that is coming out doing interviews and you're proud that they're your manager. Yeah, Absolutely. Would you be a bit concerned, like if England were to have a poor World Cup and Southgate leaves, that the FA might come a knock in and his head no. might be turned? No, I, I've, I've read a few things about about this in the last week, obviously with the England performances, but I'm not, I'm not that worried about it. I think like other people are. Um, I just think I don't know why he'd want to do it at his age. I just think mm. he, he's going to want that that day to day experience of, of club management where he's involved in everything i just don't know how someone at his stage of his career 
um, where, where he's got such an exciting project to be part of, that the club's put their faith in him. They're putting the whole structure in place to work around him, around Dan Ashworth. Um, I don't, I think the club wouldn't, even if we do have a bad run, I think he'd still be supported. They're definitely in it for the long term with him. And I think he, he should know that. Um, I'm sure he does. Um, so I just don't know why he would he would want to get off that get off that ride when it's when it's still at the early stages, you know, when there's so much excitement to come, um, and he he can spearhead it. Why why would you want to take the England job at that point? When it's the England job's always going to be there. Yeah, no. Well, right. but the other side of the argument is they might never come calling again. So oh, they will. They will. They will. Time's on his side, like you say. Yeah, he, well, he's, he's so young, that's the thing. But but that might be the only thing where it, it might enter his head, where you think, well, you know, you you might only get offered it once. And But even, but even then, it doesn't mean it's the right decision, does it? Mm, true. Who knows? True, I'm trying to true. get inside Eddie Howe's head here, but, um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not worried is the answer to your question. Oh, thank goodness. Thank goodness. Oh, obviously, the, the... if I was a Brighton fan before, yes, left, I think he he would have been the one. But even then, I don't know at his at the stage of his career whether he he would have wanted to go there. No, definitely mm, not. Definitely not. Uh, yeah. Just give it to like an older, wiser head who sort of had those best years of club management behind them. Do you know what I mean? Give it to Arsene Wenger or something. Yeah, Steve Bruce. <laughs> I didn't say that. I'm nothing. <laughs> good, good. We'll move on. Um, <laughs> um, well, obviously, BT have, BT have announced their Premier League matches up to the World Cup, Lindsay. Newcastle haven't been chosen yet at St. James's Park, which I know is a, probably a dagger to your heart. But mm. I would imagine... Because you secretly I mean, kicked off after Anfield and just like... <laughs> like the equipment was damaged. Shea, you and yeah. Shay went on a mad rampage. Me and Shay went on a massa, <laughs> yeah. Dem- Demand, demand, and we get the chance to put it right at St James's Park. I'd love, I'd love, I'd love us to, to get a Newcastle pick soon at St James's. I'd love nothing more. I'd love to shit sh- to do it again as well. I thought he was absolutely brilliant. So um, let's let's hope so. Um, the only good thing is the um, one of our games is on a Sunday, which means I've got the Saturday off, so I can come to the Brentford game. Hey. But not in a working capacity, but hopefully that will happen soon. Well, that's good though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. Um, and actually, the game on the Sunday is at Everton, so it's quite handy. So I'm staying, right. staying up, staying up north. Yeah, you got to just north, the north of best anyway. But I was just going to say, in regards to that, is that how much are you looking forward to that moment when you find out? Oh my God! Right, Newcastle at St James's Park on the Saturday lunchtime. Will there be more nerves or more more butterflies in the stomach, or can you treat it? I as think more excitement. Another Premier League game. You can because you have to, and and like we spoke about earlier, you know, you have to obviously retain that degree of professionalism. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think I think it will be more excitement. I think just just the absolute privilege of doing that job, presenting Premier League um, at St James's Park with the atmosphere being back to the way it was, it'll just be the, the excitement of the occasion and and, and, the, and the privilege of, of being in that position. Yeah, St. James's Park is back and better than ever. But And we'll, and we'll get real some earmuffs beforehand. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's going to need them. I and mean, even that, that might not work. But um, what, what's your favourite Newcastle United memory or moment from, from being a fan for, for all these years then? What's that constant memory in the back of your head that makes you always makes you smile i think just being there in in town like i said earlier when we when we got promoted for the open top bus parade Mm. um just all the shirts and people literally on rooftops traffic lights i was the first time i've ever saw people hanging off traffic lights in my life (laughs) you know i just it was just amazing um and the whole the whole city just buzzing and, and coming together as one to celebrate the team, it was it was brilliant. It was just a great time, wasn't it, to to be a Newcastle fan that that whole period under Keegan. It was it was amazing. Yeah, yeah that's why I was a Newcastle fan. Johnny's a bit younger, despite his hairline. I to know. remember, that. 
I know. My mine was the Savoy Robson days, Lindsay. So I always remember. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, they they were they were just as good as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Barcelona. Shola scoring at Barcelona. Milan yeah. two two. Yeah, great days. Great days. Certainly and just actually being happy about losing games. I mean, who'd have thought that as a football <laughs> fan? Like actually, actually coming away from like a four-three defeat and being happy and proud because you were part of that that spectacle and that that occasion and and managing that, that, to not. It's coming back. Look, the other week from like how you'd be fuming back in the day of losing a bottle in a three-one lead at home. To, to Man City, but now, like, I defy anyone not to be proud of that performance. It was great. Definitely, just going toe to toe with with those teams again is is brilliant, isn't it? Just knowing that we're going to give everyone a game, whoever it is, and not be phased by it. It can be Liverpool, it can be Man City. They are not going to play against us, whether it's home or away, and not know that they've they have, haven't been in a game. Did you have any experiences with the previous owner in terms of? Maybe when you were at St James's covering a game, or maybe an away game, and you kind of did you not? If did you see him in any capacity? No, do you know what I didn't actually? Um, I mean, let's be honest, he didn't do many interviews, did he? Um, no. And um, he wasn't he wasn't around that much, so um, no, never never met him, never interviewed him. Um, if you could, would have, what would what would be the one question you would ask him? God, when are you going? (laughs) 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 And a a lot more that I can't can't think of off the top of my head. But yeah, that it would it would have been fascinating. But I just I think you would have just got the stock um, PR answers rather than the genuine truth. Mm. So I'm not sure I would have enjoyed it. No. I think there's so many questions you could have asked them, but again, it'll be fascinating to see what happens with the new owners and maybe have a chance having an interview with one of the new owners. What would be going? I'm nicking Sam's questions here, but what would be the one question you want to maybe ask a, an Amanda Stavey or a Mia Dagadusi potentially? Oh, God. Um, I just, I think, just, I don't know. I think I'm really happy with everything they're doing. So um, I, I am. I, I mean, I like, I like the strategy. I, I like the way they're going with things. Um, I'd obviously love to know the the transfer plans going forward. Um, but after what they've done so far, um, I've got faith in that. I, I trust in that. But yeah, I'd love to know what the what the policy is going to be, sort of as we step it up to the next level. Because I think we've been filling in a lot of gaps at the moment with the players we brought in, and it's not. It's not the end game. It was very much players who were brought in, first of all, to secure survival and then to add that sort of quality and experience and sprinkle that in the squad to take us to the next level. So I just I think I'd want to know what the what the next step is, you know, mm. not and I, it's not because I want big stars to come in, but just how we how we move it on to, so that we, we become you know, someone who's not just going to be comfortably staying in the league and giving everyone a game to someone who can actually compete, genuinely compete for yeah. for Champions League place. <laughs> oh, yes, please. I mean, like like we all know, it's, it's a long-term plan, as you say, but what would you class as success for this season? Because I'm quite laid back about it. I just think top 10 and a cup run, that'll ding-dang do for me. What would, what yeah. would you count as success for short I'd, term? I'd love to get the... Um, Europa Conference League place. I know that's not very glamorous or exciting for a lot of people, but I just think it would just get us back into European football and just let us taste that again before we're ready for the for the next step that I keep talking about. But it would just give the fans the excitement of having some European fixtures in the calendar. Um, you know, and and and, and you can volunteer us, get, to work Thursday nights and get us ready, and then I'm I'm available for every Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be definitely um, throwing my throwing my hat in the ring for that one, but um, yeah. but yeah, no, I think that that I'd, I'd love that. But like you said, yeah, I'm not, I'm quite happy with just a, a decent season, competing with the top teams, giving everyone a game, putting in good, exciting performances, actually attacking player, attacking teams, and um, and going at them. Do you know what I mean? Rather than just trying not to lose, just going out to try and win matches, um, and, and staying 
very comfortably in the Premier League. I'd be happy with that. Yeah, very realistic. And I'd love to see Newcastle back in you. That'd be amazing. But finally, Lindsay, what has been the best game that you've ever hosted for any company that you've worked for? It doesn't have to be Newcastle. It can just be any game, any competition. Is there one standout game or moment? Oh, God, that's a tough question. I might, I might pick something completely random. Um because, I, because I've, I've been lucky enough to host so many good top level games um, in the Champions League and, and Premier League for, for BT. Um, but for utter madness and chaos, and which I think football is sometimes, is just chaos, as Danny Baker always used to say to me, football's just chaos. It's just, just for the madness of the game. Um, I did an FA Cup game with Wimbledon and Curzon Ashton. <laughs> <laughs> um, there you go. I said I was going to pick something random. I love that. And Curzon Ashton, who I can't even remember what division they were in, but it was, I might have even been like eighth tier or something. I can't even remember. Um, anyway, total outsiders in the game. And they went 3 0 up. And then Wimbledon came back and won it 4 3. But the whole <laughs> game was bonkers. It was just one of those where you literally came off air and you like could hardly get your breath back. And it was just brilliant fun. It was at Curzon Ashton. So it was it was proper classic FA Cup. This is what football's all about. The underdog's gonna win this, the storm in ahead. It was nearly the fairy tale, the dream come true. And then Wimbledon fought back and broke everyone's hearts. It was like a proper FA Cup story. And sometimes they're the moments that really stand out. It's not the games of the big teams. Oh, see, this is why I love doing this show. Because last week <laughs> with um, Simon Smith, the goalkeeping coach, we got to talk about John Carell's and Lionel Perez. And now this week... We've got Curzon and Ashton. Ashton. I there love you it. Go. Love it's it. It's one of those games. I still talk to the producer about it occasionally, who who worked on it with me. Cur that Curzon Ashton and match often gets gets a mention, especially when it comes down to sort of FA Cup games and stuff. Love there you go. Bonkers, bonkers, bonkers. I'm glad you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. But but hopefully, um, you know, there'll there'll be some good ones at St James's Park to come. Certainly will be, and you'll be the one covering them for BT, Lindsay. So, Lindsay, we'd we'll like to wish you all the very best this season and for the next couple of seasons while BT have the rights for the Premier League, and I'm sure we'll see it at St James's very, very soon covering a Newcastle win. I hope, I hope so. I hope, I'd like that very much. Thank you for having so, me on. No, it's been an absolute pleasure. Sam, where can everybody listen to this podcast? Links are in the description for YouTube. The audio podcast is released every Tuesday, so please hit that five-star review if you're listening on Spotify or on iTunes. Fantastic. So for, so for myself, Jonathan Green, with my co-host Sam Milner, and our guest today, Lindsay Hillgrave, we'll see you all very soon. <laughs>